Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Penny Ballum. I'm the chair of Vancouver Coastal Health. And as I've been taught by elders who have supported our health authority and my colleague, Leslie Bonshore, I'm a sister, a daughter, grandmother, auntie, come from a large family of siblings and many nieces and nephews all over our country. And I'd like to welcome you here tonight. This is a virtual meeting and I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh and home to many indigenous peoples from across our country and abroad. I'm very, very privileged to co-host this meeting tonight with Chief Marilyn Slett of the Healthsick Nation and Deborah Baker of the Squamish Nation, two incredible members of our board of Vancouver Coastal Health. And I, I'd like to start this evening by inviting Deborah Baker to provide the land acknowledgement. Deborah. Thank you. On Hot Squalls, it's a beautiful day. Really want to welcome each and every one of you and uh, would like to acknowledge the traditional territory of 14 First Nation communities, including Haltzik, Kittisu, Lilwat, Muskium, Nakwaka, Newhawk, Samakum, Seashell, Shishalf, Skatin, Skatin, Skomish Oak, Slalom, Slaywatooth, Wanaku, sorry, my apologies for the for the names, and Haksta. We acknowledge and Inuit people as well and Indigenous people away from home who joined us tonight. I welcome Elder Pauline Waterfall from the Haltzik Nation who will offer an opening prayer. Osiam. Thank you so much, Kana, Deborah Baker. Um, I uh, unfortunately, Elder Pauline has is not able to be with us tonight, so we had a change. And I'd like to really thank and welcome Elder Doris Fox of the Musqueam Nation, who will offer tonight our opening prayer. Elder Doris. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the traditional territory of the Musqueam people. We raise our hands in gratitude to you for coming in a spirit of love, honor, friendship, and respect. We'd like to thank everyone for having brought us all together for this very um, wonderful circle. I ask Great Spirit to protect each one of you and guard you all from harm, including the harm that we do to ourselves. Often we are our own worst critic and we forget about the wonderful work that we've done before we made a mistake. Know that it's okay to make a mistake and that it's okay to admit that you've done it and then to make things right. We raise our hands in gratitude to you, Great Spirit, for helping us to come from a place of love and light because it is in that state where we get the most work done that is the most beneficial for all concerned. We raise our hands in gratitude to each one of those who, are come, who have come here to learn. I want you to understand that it is not just you that will be learning, that we will be learning from you as well. We raise our hands in gratitude for the great spirit to give us the courage and the strength each day to get up rejuvenated and refreshed, to do his good work in his good name each and every day. We raise our hands in gratitude for helping everyone to understand not so much or not so much well followings, that we are all one, that we are all one people. That's what those two 
little phrases mean. We are all in this together. We are in the same canoe, hopefully paddling in the same direction. We're all on this planet together, hurtling through space at 67,000 miles an hour. We are all one on the earth. And we need to remember that. You cannot have one group who is over top to lord their power and strength over top of another just because you want what they had, the land, the hunting, the fishing, etc. Know that we sit in a circle together, although it be virtual, that in a circle there is no one above us and no one below us, that there is no one person or one group of people who hold control over the other, that we are all the same. Not so much. We are all one. So I raise my hands in gratitude to each one of you for being here. I give many warm blessings to each one of you. I ask that the Great Spirit continue to protect each one of you, to guide you in the path that he would like us all to go and to come from a place of love and light, which is where we all need to be. And I'd like to thank Leslie for the use of her beautiful and very sacred feather. Um, as we all know, the eagle is very special and very sacred to each one of us. And those of us who are blessed to have the eagle feathers have the eagle as our messenger between us and Great Spirit. So I raise my hands in gratitude, Leslie, for the use of your beautiful, beautiful feather. So thank you so much, Penny, and thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Elder Doris, for your thoughtful prayer and words to us um, as we embark on this journey tonight of our, our circle, our kitchen, our kitchen table. Um, I, I'd like to um, now ask Dr. Sorry, Chief Marilyn Slett to make some comments. We're very honored to have Marilyn on our board. She's such a great contributor and, and such a leader in her nation in Bella Bella. So what, Marilyn, welcome and please share you. your comments. Thanks, Kapeni, and uh, thank you for the beautiful prayer uh, to open us up and, and start us off in a really good uh, grounded and balanced um, way. I'm um, Marilyn Slett. I'm a member of the Hilsa community and I'm uh, joining in from uh, from Bella Bella today and we have a wind warning uh, so hopefully my power stays on. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really been um, you know, I'm uh, really honored to be a part of uh, Vancouver Coastal Health. You know, as Indigenous communities, whether, you know, we're rural like Bella Bella or uh, urban um, in the Lower Mainland, you know, as Indigenous people, we have, um, you know, we have vision, a vision of how uh, we want our communities to be and, you know, to be healthy and to be thriving. And we know that those solutions and how we get there will be driven by by our people, but we also need some allies and, and people to work with. So, you know, this is um, a part of a, a relationship, you know, in terms of moving forward with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health. And, you know, we have um, uh, much to offer each other and uh, in that learning. So I'm really pleased to be here tonight uh, with my colleagues and and uh, just, I look forward to, you know, the dialogue because we know that there's so much, you know, that uh, we can be doing and things that we need to put in front of our radar. So this is a, a really good opportunity to start that dialogue, Guy Exica. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And um, I'd like to turn now to another one of our Board of Directors, Deborah Baker from the Squamish Nation and welcome you, Deborah, and ask you to make some comments. You're, you're a recent member uh, addition to our board and we're so, so thrilled to have you. Your, your contribution already has been so terrific. So welcome tonight. 
Thank you, Penny. Thank you, uh, Marilyn, and to all the board members of Vancouver Coastal Health and the staff, and also to FNHA. Um, thank you for joining us, as well as all the participants that are uh, First Nations, Inuit, or Métis that are within our Vancouver Coastal Region. I really want to hold up my hands, Chen Kormantomi, for all the leadership that uh, Vancouver Coastal Health has taken with the current pandemic that we're dealing with COVID and uh, how it's impacted many of our communities. And I want to send a special prayer to all those who may have uh, gotten the uh, virus and those who are recovering and uh, also want to say a special prayer to those who are uh, following all the safety protocols and uh, doing their best to protect themselves, their families and their community. And I also, also want to take a moment to um, acknowledge residential school survivors and the day scholars and the day students, as well as the 60 scoop uh, children and the what our people have gone through for many generations and those who are on their healing journey, I really wanna hold up my hands to each and every one of you. I also wanna acknowledge the opioid crisis that uh, many of our communities are dealing with today and the overdoses that have been happening and some of them have been very fatal, but others have survived. And I just really wanna thank Vancouver Coastal Health for doing their due diligence and the best in a human and a compassionate way in serving not only us as Indigenous people, but all the people that live in within our Vancouver coastal region and being a leader in the province. So Penny, thank you. And thank you to all the board members and to my colleague, Marilyn Slett, and um, especially Leslie Boncher, who is our Vice President of Indigenous Health Services and the many thousands of employees of Vancouver Coastal Health. Thank you for keeping us alive to the best of your ability. And I, I send out my, my warm thoughts and positive vibes as we go to Truth and Reconciliation tomorrow, the first national day to acknowledge uh, what has happened to our people and especially to those who never made it home. As a residential school survivor myself, it is a very emotional time, but um, it's a time of healing, a time of grieving, and, and a time of uh, working together. So uh, thank you, Penny, for giving me the few minutes to share my thoughts and feelings around this. Osia. Thank you so much, Marilyn and Deborah and Elder Doris for opening this really important evening. You know, just a few technical details. The first hour of our webcast, we're, we're live streaming and it can also be seen on Facebook. And this allows everybody to see the upcoming presentations. Then the live stream will be turned off before we break into our kitchen table discussions, which we will do in breakout rooms as they call them on Zoom. The theme of tonight, as we've mentioned, is around the kitchen table. We're very excited to have an opportunity in as informal a way as possible to talk with, listen, and learn from our community. In this, our first, our first outreach directly to our Indigenous communities and partners across our health authority. To make sure that everybody feels safe and comfortable we will not be recording the kitchen table discussions and conversations. We will make every effort to place you in your preferred kitchen table conversation because we have a number of themes as you saw when you registered. But sometimes you will only have your second choice and because we, need, we want to make sure there's an even balance of voices at each kitchen table. I know these themes are very important to all of us and um, they include the cultural safety in plain sight, which is a kitchen table that will address indigenous specific racism and discrimination in our BC healthcare system. And, you know, that is the report written by um, our colleague, Mary Ellen Chappelle-Lafond and something that 
had a very significant impact on all of us working in healthcare in our province. The second theme is COVID-19 and vaccinations. And as, as Deborah has mentioned, the COVID pandemic is, has been front and center in many of our discussions uh, across the health authority and communities around the country, around the world for a long, long time now. And it's still important and important for us to be safe. And so we wanted to have one of our kitchen tables committed so that people could come and continue to ask questions and have discussions and talk about some of the issues that we're facing. The third theme is mental wellness and substance use. And Deborah mentioned the, the uh, opioid crisis, which unfortunately has worsened during our pandemic for reasons that some of which we might understand and some of which are we're still unclear, but, but it's, it's a, a pandemic in and of itself and something that we need to continue to focus on and work on. And so we welcome the conversation in the kitchen table talking about mental wellness and substance use. And finally, truth and reconciliation is the fourth theme uh, at our kitchen tables and something that, you know, as we, as we think about tomorrow being the first national day of truth and reconciliation, it's, it's, an, important, it's an important event that we are having this, this discussion, these conversations around the table tonight. So that, that's our fourth theme. Before we go on, I, I just want to welcome and just introduce the members of our board who are here on the, on the Zoom tonight. Uh, Wendy Au, Bill Duval, Dr. Marg McGregor, Aob Nazgi, and Dr. Kathy Greenberg and Alan Bedela, who I, I don't know, I haven't seen them yet, but who are also very all respected members of our board who work very hard on behalf of our communities across the, the whole geography of our health authority to, to bring the input and their observations of how we're doing as perceived by our community and who contribute to the work and, and helping guide, you know, our, our big, very complicated organization in the, in the care of the people across our geographic authority. About one and a quarter million people live in Vancouver Coastal and they live in very, very rural and remote areas and big urban areas. And, you know, the, the work of making sure that we properly and safely and respectfully care for them uh, is, is a really important part of the work that our board does. So along with Deborah and Marilyn, I, I just wanna thank all of you board members for all your incredible work and for being here tonight and for your commitment to truth and reconciliation and the ongoing journey of making our healthcare system a safe and culturally sensitive and respectful place for our indigenous community to come and get help when they need it. I also want to welcome and introduce our senior team uh, Vivian Eliopoulos, our president and CEO, who has been such a remarkable leader for us throughout the pandemic. Leslie Bonjour, who's the first vice president of Indigenous Health in our authority. Uh, Leslie is such a leader in our organization, has taught us so much, and I think it was very, very thrilling for all of us to see her named as a vice president uh, in the last few months and to, just to see her continue to soar as she as she leads our work in across our organization and building helping us build an organization that you know is doing the right thing uh, when it comes to you know serving our indigenous community dr don wilson who's the new medical director of indigenous health and don you and i have not had a chance to meet but uh, we're very, very happy to and, and proud to have you appointed as our first medical director of Aboriginal Indigenous Health. And we welcome you tonight and, and to, to our organization and to the board. It's very great to have you. Dr. Brittany Bingham, who is the director of Indigenous Cultural Safety and Education. Um, Brittany has, you know, already made her presence known and has brought us, um, you know, uh, just like, 
help Leslie move along our agenda around that is so critical to our work around cultural safety and respect for our our patients, their families, and, and the whole community in our work. Um, I think many of you know Dr. Patricia Daly, who's our chief medical health officer, who's our public health leader and has led the COVID response and worked so hard. Um, we all have a little giggle when we, when we talk about Patty, we don't think she ever went home actually for the first six months of the pandemic, but she has worked uh, and led a remarkable team that has you know, done an incredible job in our health authority, along with many other staff to keep our public as safe as, as is possible and, and uh, help manage our, this response to the pandemic. Um, I also wanna welcome Dr. Mark Lesition, who's our deputy medical health officer, chief medical health officer. Mark as well has been a, a really key leader in our public health response. Dr. Michael Schwant, also one of our medical health officers who we're gonna hear from tonight, who has done a, just an incredible amount of work around different areas of our response to the pandemic. And there are many other members of our VCH senior executive team uh, here tonight. And, you know, just a shout out to all of them. We're, we're so happy that you're here. We're all on this journey together and together with our elders, um, Elder Pauline, Elder Roberta, Elder Ruth, Elder Glida, Elder Doris, who have done such incredible work in our organization, both with our Aboriginal health program under Leslie's guidance, but more importantly, we see them around and about our different facilities. Our patients know and their families know they're around. It makes them feel safe. It makes them, you know, have a different mindset as they come in into a, an institutions that are not necessarily places that they, they would feel safe. And when our elders are there and, and helping welcome them, even we found even a poster that had Elder Roberta on it, we know has been a comfort. So the power of our elders um, and the, the, the work that they've done to teach us is uh, just so, so important. So I want to thank you to everyone who's joined our meeting tonight. We look forward to our kitchen table conversations. And but first, as we go into them, we're going to provide two presentations, one on uh, public health um, and one on Indigenous health. And I, I really want to acknowledge the, the ongoing, you know, relationship and partnership between VCH and our First Nations Indigenous peoples. Our First Nations Health Authority, who is our, our close partner in so much of the work that we do, and just our deep acknowledgement of the importance of providing culturally safe, high quality healthcare service um, for the people of, you know, we provide care to people across this province as well as our own health authority. As I said, it's a privilege to be meeting the evening before Orange Shirt Day and our first day of truth and reconciliation for our country. In a few minutes, we're going to discuss the, the BCH work and journey in responding to the In Plain Sight report. It's a report which deeply impacted us. I think all of us felt both discouraged at what was evident from the report and also we felt that we knew that there was an opportunity for us to do better and that we are in a position where we have so many friends and colleagues on this journey with us and we have more strength than our authority and we will continue and build on this journey. There are many commitments that have been made since the Royal Commission report on Aboriginal peoples 20 years ago. But the gap that was identified at that time related to the health inequities between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people persists. And it's our work now. We have to close that gap. We have to close the gap of health outcomes and well-being. And we have to close the gap of the experience of receiving health care in our authority and in our province and our country. And we have a long way to go to address these inequities but we feel, as I said, better positioned with knowledgeable 
experienced, seasoned leaders from the Aboriginal and Indigenous community. Um, we are very clear and we have, you know, we, we have a government that is committed and very clear with us as health authorities on the commitments to fulfill the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Report, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And, you know, the, the commission into the um, missing and murdered women, which, you know, as a city manager at the time in Vancouver, um, in the city of Vancouver, also a, a critical document that lays out the journey and the work for us. So I just want to, you know, recommit um, at this time to our health authorities work and, and really our intention that it is going to be different, that we are going to make a difference and we need to do that in a timely way. And we, we don't have, you know, the, the rest of this century to, to, to get to the solutions. We, we have to do this now. So we are on this work. We need cultural safety ingrained in every interaction, every transaction, every moment of care by every member of our healthcare team and all the other people that support that healthcare team. It, it, it's right down to our housekeepers, our food service workers, our security folks, anybody and everybody who contributes to the work that we do as a health authority needs to be done and, and needs to understand and make their contribution. It's the time and it can be done. I just want to say that we share our very deep sorrow at, at the news of the unmarked graves that are being recovered at former, former residential schools across this country. As a grandmother, I can tell you that just to envision, you know, what that, what that was like to have children taken away and never return, um, it, it's unconscionable. And our, our heartfelt condolences go to families and survivors and all of the Indigenous peoples across our country who are mourning these very, very tragic losses. And I, I, just, I just would say that, you know, every time we, we hear of another discovery, um, we're reminded of our role as a health authority and our responsibility to advance truth and reconciliation to acknowledge that these things happened and how devastating they were and continue to be and how critical it is that we educate ourselves and learn and, and we can't feel what that feels like if it hasn't happened to us, but we need to do everything to ensure that we understand how to provide culturally safe healthcare. You know, this is, as I mentioned, a time of two public health emergencies, COVID-19 and the opioid overdose. These are issues we've been focused on for many, many months and talked about. We also this summer uh, experienced extreme heat, like a devastating heat wave that was really unprecedented in our, in our province and the devastating wildfires, which are you know just uh, another log worse than what we've experienced in past summers over the last 20 years and i think that tonight what we what we thought we would do we will have a kitchen table talking about covid and and the and issues around substance use and the opioid overdose but we we asked dr michael schwant for our public health presentation which is a part of all of our out um, our board open board sessions, we, we asked him to talk to us about climate change and how, how that relates to our health authority. And that acknowledges, um, you know, really that climate change in some ways is a root issue for many of the things, including the pandemic with COVID that, that we are facing. And so, you know, I wanna, I wanna welcome Dr. Schwant, um, who I introduced to you, our, our, one of our medical health officers and, and just ask him to take the microphone and, and provide us um, with an update and a, and a really interesting discussion that will, I know, deeply touch members of our Indigenous community who are sharing uh, this evening with us because 
As First Nations and Indigenous peoples, you've been aware of climate change and the need to protect our Mother Earth um, for a very, very, very long time. And so this is old news to you. Um, and, you know, we've asked Michael to just talk a little bit about our thoughts and, you know, what is our responsibility as a health authority to, you know, make a contribution to addressing these very, very severe and significant issues. So, Michael, welcome and over to you. Thanks very much for the, the introduction to the, to the topic and the, the warm welcome to the meeting as well. That was very, uh, I'm speaking here from the uh, uh, Vancouver offices of Vancouver Coastal Health, and I wanted to note that I am uh, on the whole lines of the Western Squamish and say with you people. I think this is an important, especially important when talking about issues of climate change or environmental health, especially here as we are on the eve of the of our first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. When we talk about climate change, we need to uh, uh, reckon with and understand the uh, the truth of the effects of colonization on our, our climate and the inequitable uh, effects that that's had, and also to, to reconcile, to ensure that we have an equitable uh, climate change response and that we're able to undo some of the injustices that, have, uh, that uh, climate change has, has wrought, truly. Now, let's share my screen here. If uh, it's possible to get a, a thumbs up if this is showing, or rather a thumbs down if it isn't, great. This is what we're talking about right now in terms of climate change. Uh, this blue line here is even if we reach the, uh, the Paris goals for uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we talk about so much in the news day today, we're still likely to see temperature change that persists over the next several decades. This is a best case scenario. When we look at worst case scenarios, so with uh, uh, fewer reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, we're likely to see more and more increases in temperature globally, that uh, certainly includes in BC and, and other parts of the world as well. And those impacts aren't just related to the temperature uh, directly, as important as those are for our health. This has impacts on flooding, on wildfires, uh, as we were just discussing, on landslides, and all of those impacts on both humans, um, infrastructure, and our health system uh, are quite important, as I'll try to speak to you about briefly here today. So in short, uh, climate science right now is predicting that we'll continue to have changes to our climate here in British Columbia, even with future greenhouse gas reductions. Now, it's not to say that that's not important. We want to, I mean, we need to mit mitigate future greenhouse gas emissions, um, but we also need to adapt to climate change that is already happening and is going to continue over the, uh, the decades that are right in front of us. We do expect that these changes are going to negatively impact much of our health service delivery, our facilities and health directly, and, but these are things that we can adapt to and plan for. Uh, it's very important that we identify these risks early uh, as we're beginning to and start to plan ahead. Now, I won't go through each and every one of these, but it's just to say that uh, the, uh, the climate change can affect us in many different ways, including the heat directly uh, through extreme heat events uh, and, and related heat illness, but also through poor air quality. We see increased amounts of uh, wildfires or, or pollutants in the air that relate to higher temperatures, storms and flooding, as I mentioned, and also infectious diseases, which maybe less intuitively uh, can be increased or changed in their patterns. We have different uh, different seasons for uh, pathogens as well as the uh, animals and vectors that can carry them. Then finally, ecosystem changes themselves. When we look at the the larger environment around us can affect our water security, certainly small water systems, which are very important in British Columbia, uh, as well as food security. All of these things can be affected. So there's many different pathways from a change in climate to impacts on our health. Just to look at one example of those many health impacts, there's been project projections in Metro Vancouver that the number of days over 30 degrees, what we call very hot days uh, and for most of us, are likely to increase over the next 30 years or so from roughly two days a year, being quite rare in fact, to 14 days every year. So fully two weeks of the, of the summer being over 30 degrees as a high temperature. And this is something that uh, we know can be associated with heat stroke, heat illness, and even death over time. And this past summer, we saw something quite a lot like that, unfortunately. You see in this graph here, just average temperatures uh, through the year. In 2019 or 20, those cool green and blue years, uh, lower temperatures, normal uh, balmy summer temperatures. And in 2021, some very high, uh, high temperatures day after day, almost unheard of previously in Vancouver uh, for almost a full week sustain. And unfortunately, we did see that this had a severe health impacts. This is something that was widely reported, probably well known by everybody who's on this call, uh, not just in our health region, but our neighboring regions as well, a really high toll of death. And I think this really presents the need 
for us to understand and adapt to climate change, which is happening around us right now. So how are we doing that in uh, Vancouver Coastal Health and our public health program? Uh, one of the ways that we've been moving ahead is to do a project called the Health Adapt Project. Uh, this is something that was funded by Health Canada. There's different programs uh, across the country who have similar uh, projects ongoing right now. And Vancouver and Coastal Health, Fraser Health together, have, uh, have been a leader in Western Canada around some of this work. There's two phases to it. One of them is a vulnerability assessment that we're just wrapping up right now, trying to understand which communities within our regions might be most affected, which individuals uh, to the different underlying risk factors could be, could be most impacted, and what are the uh, potential facilities, health conditions, and so on that could be most impacted. So really understanding what are those impacts that we might see. And then the next phase of this, which we're moving into now, is to try to actually develop a strategy around that. So anticipating those changes, not waiting for them to come to us and always being uh, reactive to these events when they happen. How can we get a step ahead and plan for things like extreme heat, uh, wildfire and, and uh, air quality events, flooding and so on. Now, I wanted to take the chance today to discuss how this Health Adapt project, how our climate change adaptation planning has engaged with Indigenous communities in BCH. You know, we know in many different places globally and in Canada and in BC, but a lot of work has shown that Indigenous uh, people are often the, uh, contributing the least to climate change in terms of uh, carbon emissions, uh, and yet remain among the most impacted due to, again, some of the, historic, the historical legacies of uh, environmental inequities putting people at greater risk to the changes related to climate change. Uh, so this is how can have impacts on not just uh, health in the most direct sense, but also on cultural practices and medicines, on food sovereignty, as well as food safety and security and directly on physical and mental health, some of the ways that I, that I had mentioned. So we've been very uh, deliberate about trying to engage with First Nations communities right from the very beginning of this uh, vulnerability assessment project, uh, with consultation with a number of different uh, communities today, and a number of those being planned uh, right now. We're really trying to uh, have a, a deep level of engagement uh, with these different communities that I named here. A couple of the key findings, although this will be written in great detail in some of the uh, some of the reports coming out of this uh, of this consultation on our future strategy. A couple of key things, and I'd be interested to learn what people's uh, thoughts are on this or what your own experiences have been. But the what's come to us over and over again is the idea that climate change is not necessarily considered as a separate event or a separate uh, crisis from other systemic challenges and risks in the communities that we've talked to. It's well understood what's happening in terms of climate change. But most of the experts that we talked to from communities describe this in terms of its linkage to some of the other systemic issues uh, that surround communities. And this is something that we think is very important to not have a siloed approach when we describe climate adaptation in our, in our own uh, responses. And another thing that's come back to us often is when we look at these, as I mentioned, those inequitable exposures and the potential for uh, inequitable impacts, the idea that Indigenous people should not be thought of as inherently vulnerable, as is so often described in different uh, parts of the medical or public health literature, but really that we need to take a strengths-based approach and examine some of the uh, some of the capacities that exist in communities that are actually adapting to climate change, have for uh, since time immemorial, and are, are continuing to do so as we speak. So one of the things that our project began to do is actually collect and catalog some of these climate change initiatives uh, that are happening, many around food security, many around water security, uh, and ways of land management to actually start to, to learn from and not try to dictate a top-down approach in terms of how we want to respond to climate change in our region. Another thing that we've done in the course of this uh, vulnerability assessment is try to create maps of the, uh, of the potential impacts of climate change. And, and these, uh, these examples that you show here are looking at vulnerabilities to high temperatures, to wildfire smoke, ground level ozone, which is a very important pollutant. Uh, as well as flooding in different parts of the region that I've selected for the sake of this graphic. When we talk about vulnerability, we're looking not just at the weather, the most the direct impact itself, but also what is the population that's experiencing it? What's the age makeup of that community? What are the pre-existing illnesses in that community? And as well, what's the adaptive capacity that can actually counteract some of that vulnerability? So we might look at the for example, the tree canopy in different neighborhoods uh, or other factors that allow a, a community to, to resist some of the potential effects of climate change. And this has been done in, in cooperation with the experts at UBC to help to predict where might the effects might be the greatest. This can help with our planning in a very direct sense and also to really help to engage communities. I think when people 
uh, or face to face with some of these maps. It really does uh, spur good scene action in uh, from uh, political decision makers to administrators in city uh, and town governments uh, and, and people just in the general public as well, who of course uh, are our most important stakeholder of all. One thing I wanted to share is, you know, quite unfortunately with the extreme heat events of this uh, past summer, we had quite a bit of data on the vulnerability of people to uh, climate change in terms of extreme heat pushing people to emergency room visits right across our region. So on the left here, you see the vulnerability mapping where we expected some of the impacts to be the highest from all of that data that I was describing. And on the right, you see uh, where the sources of, um, of emergency room visits were in terms of people's homes. So this is of course a heat map meant to, uh, uh, to protect privacy and not show people's exact street addresses, but it's really showing the areas of the city that in terms of emergency room visits were most vulnerable to the extreme heat event. So this is something that's helping us both to plan directly and also to engage with some of our local partners and community organization, government, and the public. So I just wanted to leave with the idea, as I've mentioned, this is a huge uh, global health threat right now. Uh, August experts like those at the, the Lancet Countdown on, on Health and Climate Change have said so, but also noted that it's a great opportunity. Uh, when we start to address some of these social and environmental determinants of health, we can also uh, get to a, a state of health that's more equitable and hopefully better for everybody in the in the longer run. So trying to think of this as both a challenge and an opportunity uh, is something that I'd really encourage. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, really appreciate your presentation. It's such a an important issue and is, as you've described, we have a lot to learn from our Indigenous communities. Um, I, I know, I just know a little bit, Chief Marilyn Sled, about the work that you're leading up in Bella Bella um, around climate change and adaption. So I, I think it's very, very timely to, to have just got a little bit of a nugget of the kind of work that's underway, Michael. Thank you so much. So I now would like to introduce Leslie Bonshore, who's, as I as I said earlier, our, our new Vice President of Indigenous Health and a tremendous leader in our province, in our health authority. And Leslie's just going to, you know, provide some insight into the different initiatives that are underway in our Indigenous Health Program and what are the opportunities we see in the, in the future and, you know, just how important um, this program is to our ability to address the issues of cultural safety and, and respect and, and really enhancing the outcomes for our First Nations, Indigenous peoples. Leslie is joined by Dr. Don Wilson, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the, our first medical director for the Aboriginal health team, a very experienced physician who came to us. We, we grabbed him from Alberta, came into VCH to Richmond, and uh, he's now got a really important position, uh, leadership position for us in our medical staff. So welcome, both of you. Thank you so much, Penny. Um, I'm going to zip through this PowerPoint as quickly as I can to leave a couple of moments for Dawn to, to speak to the work that we're doing. How is my sound? Am I okay? Sometimes I'm too loud. It's good, I get Leslie. excited. Okay, yeah. thank you. So um, as mentioned, uh, Penny, thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for being so forward thinking um, to bring an Indigenous focused open board forum um, to life. And uh, as you mentioned, thank you to everyone behind the scenes, uh, making sure that this happened and that we were all sorted and ready for this event. Let me start by... Um, I would do a land acknowledgement. I think Deborah did a fantastic job of pronouncing all of the 14 First Nations. Again, I just want to acknowledge that I'm here in the Office of Indigenous Health here in East Vancouver on the unceded homelands of Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. And I will um, again acknowledge all other nations, but instead of going through all of the names, I also wanted to just take a moment at this point to acknowledge um, Deborah and Marilyn as being um, our Indigenous representatives on the board. Um, I thank you for bringing that voice and that lens to our board of directors. I want to acknowledge uh, Kim Brooks. Uh, our VP of the Vancouver Coastal First Nations Health Authority Regional Team. Thank you for joining us, Kim. And also to Harmony Johnson, uh, also uh, our new VP of Indigenous Health over at um, Providence Healthcare, uh, two amazing partners that I have the privilege of working with. 
So our intention is really just to provide a, a very high level overview of some of the work that we have going inside this health system. Uh, we have really focused on working with all of the leaders across the health system, all programs and services in every corner of this health authority to ensure that we are working with um, the leaders to to do that hardwiring, as it's been coined, uh, hardwiring of the Indigenous lens into everything that we do. Um, working with our communities of care and wherever the priorities lend themselves. Tonight, we're going to focus on the priorities that have been outlined in plain sight, the Mary Ellen Turple LaFond uh, report on racism in healthcare. And I really want to introduce our team, our new leadership positions, and the kind of roles and expertise that they bring to their jobs. Um, some of you that are here may be new to Indigenous health. Uh, um, Penny mentioned how, you know, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, the RCAP, we called it, report over 20 years ago now, <laughs> came out. We have been at this work for a very long time. There's no shortage of documents and priorities that we have been directed to, to um, enable and enact upon. Uh, the First Nations Health Authority, uh, Kim and her team, every few years, uh, we refresh and we review um, how we've done with their regional health and wellness plan, uh, informed by the First Nations Health Council leaders and the First Nations Health Directors Association. We, of course, have in plain sight now the report on racism in healthcare with about 24 recommendations, many of them directly related to our work. We have the Truth and Reconciliation, 94 calls to action that we are also working on. An urban Aboriginal health strategy that really has taken many, many years and many, many um, urban Aboriginal organizations goals and rolled them up into one uh, overarching health strategy. Uh, we have the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People that we are asked to uphold, which I take very seriously, especially here in, in the province of BC, where we now have the DRIPA legislation. The Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls recommendations, we are uh, embedding those into the work that we do. We, of course, have a mandate letter. The mandate letter comes from Minister Dix over to Dr. Penny Ballam as our board chair, and then we all do our best to make sure that we implement. Of course, the Métis Nation BC is an important partner and has a big role to play with our work. Uh, we also have the Tripartite First Nations Health Plan Indigenous Cultural Safety and Change Leadership Strategy that has been endorsed for over a year. But let me focus tonight just on In Plain Sight, a major piece of work that all of us are involved with. This report has been shared clear across this health authority in so many different ways. Um, many of my set colleagues who are on the call today, they have taken it and taken it to heart to their work, making sure that they're embedding and, and taking up the work that is being called upon us from the Mary Ellen Turple Bond report. I'll also note that Harmony Johnson played a big role in producing this report, and I thank her for her, her dedication and her service because that was not easy work. Um, and several of our leaders are sitting at different tables that are also addressing in plain sight. I know uh, Dr. P uh, Patty Daly, um, uh, Lorraine Blackburn, and a number of others are involved. Dean Chittick's office as well. One of our most promising practices has been working with our physicians. And as mentioned, I'm super excited to, to have Dr. Don Wilson from the Health Nation, Maryland's community, as our very first uh, director, regional director. Director of Indigenous Health. He's a member of the HAMAC, the Health Authority Medical Advisory Committee. He's helped with some ICS facilitation already. <laughs> uh, he really will provide that subject matter expertise to different physician groups. He will be a strong collaborator on our Indigenous Women's Health and Wellness agenda, along with Miranda Kelly. Uh, Dr. T Toma Timothy is a medical advisor, particularly around primary care and family physician activity. And he is from the Tla'ama Nation, another First Nations community within the Vancouver coastal region. So thrilled to have these two gentlemen addressing recommendation number 14 of the Mary Ellen Turple LaFond report to re recruit Indigenous individuals to senior positions to oversee and promote needed system change. So here is... Um, the Indigenous Health Leadership Team, we just had this photo op not that long ago, so it's fresh. Um, just super excited to say that this is a group of, uh, we like to call ourselves the aunties. I'm super happy to be the first ever um, Vice President of Indigenous Health. As Penny mentioned, I take great honour in holding that role. I've been doing this work for a number of years, 16, uh, between Fraser Health and, and here at Vancouver Coastal Health. I joined here in October 
2015. Thank you, Patty Daly, for recruiting me to the role. Um, and again, I am recommendation number 14, and this has actually been a recommendation um, since the tri um, Transform of Change Accord uh, many, many years ago, 2005, I believe, where it said they really wanted um, leadership roles in our health authorities held by Indigenous people. So not only have we done that here in Vancouver Coastal Health with my role, as I introduce um, the rest of our team, you'll see we've managed to recruit a number of Indigenous health leaders in various roles. So again, happy to be the captain of the team, helping to make sure that we're addressing all of those many, many commitments that we have made, um, particularly staying true to decolonizing this work, decolonizing how we look at things, and leading us in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, holding up those uh, truth and reconciliation calls to action, and of course, addressing racism in healthcare. That's what it's all about. So first off, we've got uh, Dr. Brittany Bingham. Uh, Brittany is recommendation number nine is to ensure that we have a process where Indigenous data governance are followed throughout and required data acquisition, access analysis and reporting. And we've talked about this before, about the importance of um, being able to collect data and learn from it. Brittany is really supporting that whole learning health systems approach. We've been doing this together actually for, for the last 10 years. Brittany worked with me over in uh, Fraser Health and came over here to Vancouver Coastal Health and again has done some absolutely amazing work around around taking the data and the research that she does and turning it into recommendations for our health system to, to address. Um, lots of focus on, on urban, the urban indigenous COVID-19 response, uh, Michael Smith uh, grant that she just is about to wrap up has been incredible. We've learned a lot. I can't wait for the first um, publication on that. And also just recently, announced today, actually I shared the announcement that uh, another Michael Smith Foundation of Health Research grant has been awarded to Brittany and her team, um, which includes Musqueam uh, and Seashelt and maybe one other community that I'm missing. But congratulations, Brittany, on an incredible job and an incredible little team that you have uh, developed. Next, we have Miranda Kelly. Miranda is also a Stalo sister and an auntie uh, from the Sawali First Nation. Uh, she's recommendation number 16, uh, directly related to responding to murder and missing Indigenous women and girls, calls for justice and specific experiences and needs of Indigenous women as outlined in the review. She has brought the um, auntie power, the birthing power, the uh, life giver power uh, to her role. She's created an amazing maternity uh, maternal advisory committee we call it the big mac and that is actually all of the elders that you have on this call tonight are part of that uh, they've really been leading and helping inform the beautiful work that uh, Miranda and her team have been doing to address uh, perinatal substance use for Indigenous women, creating lots of opportunities to have women's voices elevated within our system working with uh, all of the maternity programming Next, we have Bree Beverage. Bree is related to number seven. Number seven, she's our director of Indigenous engagement and inclusion. Now, that is a very broad, broad um, area of focus, but mostly um, she is there to help us bridge and foster relationships with all of our Indigenous partners, including the First Nations, Metis Nation, BC, and all of our urban Aboriginal organizations um, and other uh, partners like UBC or SFU. Uh, Brie has uh, been a solid member of our team for about five plus years now. She was instrumental in helping us through the COVID-19 pandemic emergency response, and she continues to support the rural and remote teams and um, most recently helping us to onboard our recruitment and retention folks. Next is Lori Quinn. She hasn't even started yet, but she has signed the, on the dotted line. She is our new uh, incoming director of Indigenous Patient Experience Team, one of the most exciting little teams inside Vancouver Coastal Health. She helps um, address recommendation number five, where we jointly develop a strategy to improve patient complaint processes and address individual and systemic Indigenous specific racism. So she has the patient quality care uh, liaisons within her team. She 
She also has the Indigenous Patient Care Clinicians, the registered nurses. We have three of them, but we're about to add some more. And she also has the Indigenous Patient Navigators on her team. Uh, we're so thrilled to have attracted Lori Quinn to our team. She'll start November 1st right now. And for the last several years, she has worked with VGH as the emergency department manager. So she comes with a ton of experience and a ton of respect from many folks that work in VGH and all over the system. Looking forward to her joining. Next, Shannon McCarthy. Um, Shannon McCarthy is our Director of Indigenous Mental Health and Wellness, and um, she's an ally, and she came to us after working for a number of years with uh, Coastal Community Care as their Director of Mental Health. We're so honoured that she's chosen to come work with us to demonstrate progress and commitments to increase access to culturally safe mental health and wellness and substance use services, recommendation number 17. Um, Shannon has also created an amazing team that is addressing and working system-wide on looking at all the services that we provide under mental health and wellness and substance use and finding a way to really hardwire that Indigenous lens, working with experts on our team and our elders and other advisors on how to make it truly embedded in a trauma-informed, Indigenous-formed practice. Next is Tiffany Craig. Tiffany is our Director of Indigenous Design and Project. She's been with us for about three years now. And one thing that she does, along with everything else, is recommendation number 10. She helps design our hospital facilities, uh, partnering with local Indigenous nations and um, our Elders Circle, again, advising on how we embed Indigenous design into absolutely everything we do. She's a very, very busy Director of Indigenous Design. She's involved with many of our projects with long-term care, hospitals, UPCCs, everywhere where we're about to put some new paint on a wall, Tiffany's part of it. Janice Wardrop is our Director of Indigenous Cultural Safety and Education. She's actually got a bunch of numbers that she's part of the recommendation, but we focused on number 20, which is develop a refreshed approach to anti-racism, cultural humility, and trauma-informed training for health workers, and um, which will be developed and implemented. She has been with us for, for uh, about two years now and has really helped renew and create a new strategy for Indigenous cultural safety training. She's from the Squamish Nation and also from the Kwantlen First Nation. Um, love the energy that... Um, Janice brings to her role. She's got a, an amazing team and is just expanding and expanding on this role and delivering cultural safety in all sorts of formats, including one-to-one -one training, team training, cohorts, um, online or in person. I also wanted to just talk about our elders and residents. We have about 30 under the leadership of, of Elder Roberta, Elder Glida, Elder Ruth, and Elder Doris. It was established in 2016, so they're celebrating their fifth anniversary of working here at Vancouver Coastal Health as our elders and residents. It really was inspired by the Nuka system of care based out of Alaska, where we learned that this care models needed to be all inclusive and team uh, wrapping um, team based care around individuals. Um, the uh, research that was done in Vancouver Aboriginal Health Society found that the elders really did actually improve health outcomes and save the system money. So we were able to actually start the elders in, uh, elders in residence program here five years ago as an option to get them started thinking maybe they would like to move over to another not-for-profit agency inside Vancouver or somewhere else. Um, but they've chosen to stay with us. And I, I think that's a great honor and a great tribute to how safe we've made the environment for them to, to lead us, to practice and to work alongside of us. They've cared for so many people. I don't know what my time's like. Let me quickly look. Um, I just have a few more things that I wanted to share. A uh, couple pictures of our team. Pink Shirt Day was really our opportunity to create a real speak up culture around the In Plain Sight report. Um, some of the other positions we've added onto our team include the Central Coast Strategic Lead, Lisa Talio from the New Hawk and Health Nation, works out of our Bella Coola Hospital, um, and we have other Central Coast Aboriginal patient navigators at both the hospitals there. I don't know what my time's like, Penny. Should I flip through these um, slides, or would you like me to pause and, and hand it over to Don for a couple of comments? Thanks, Leslie. I think you have talking to myself here on mute. <laughs> um, 
I, I think we should, we're a little bit uh, over time. So thank okay. you so much. And why don't you hand it over to Dawn? Okay, Dawn, yes, please love to hear from you and your personal experience joining our team. Thank you so much, everyone. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, it's such an honor to be here. And it's so good to be back in British Columbia, uh, back closer to my own home territory. Um, it's a, a tremendous honor to be living now in the as a guest in the territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish people. I'm in Richmond, so I believe that that is the uh, home territory of the Musqueam people. So it's, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here. Uh, having moved back here from Alberta, it's, it's uh, and as a coastal person, it's really difficult to, to say how uh, healing it has been to come closer to the ocean. And I get to see the ocean every day and uh, it really has been good uh, for myself and for my family to be here. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the tribal journeys and the pulling together uh, canoe journeys that have taken place up and down the coast uh, in British Columbia and Washington, Oregon, Alaska, um, and even with invited guests all the way from uh, some of our Polynesian relatives like Hawaii and New Zealand. Those journeys uh, have been incredibly powerful to reconnect people who used to uh, meet up on a regular basis by through um, uh, potlatching and just visiting family, friends, relatives, trade routes and everything like that. Uh, that all started way back in 1993 and canoes traveled from various communities and even the process of building those canoes which led up to those journeys um, was a very uh, powerful cultural experience for a lot of young people who uh, were able to connect with their, their community members and elders in ways that they hadn't before. And then once they embarked on those journeys and started meeting up with other Indigenous peoples, other First Nation um, relatives up and down the coast, those connections were incredibly powerful. And sometimes people would join certain canoes canoe families as they were moving along at different points in, in that journey. And I feel like I've stepped onto a canoe and I'm on a journey with all of you. Uh, and, and for me, it, it, it is incredibly meaningful to have been invited to assume this position as the Regional Medical Director of Indigenous Health. And it harkens back to a charge that was given to me by one of my elders um, uh, Granny Beatrice Brown from my own nation, from the Heiltsuk Nation. I visited her in the summer um, before I left for high school. And she told me that I would leave and I would get my education and I would go back home and work for the community and with our own people. And I wasn't able to do that because as an obstetrician gynecologist, I need to work in a bigger center. So eventually I decided I would uh, work in Indigenous health and I've done so with the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada um, as the co-chair or chair of the Indigenous Women's Health Initiatives Committee. I've done that ever since I was a resident in obstetrics and gynecology dating back to the early 2000s. And I feel like uh, my time with them has really helped me to I have a broad overview of issues affecting Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples, some of the things that we really need to work together on uh, in partnership uh, between Indigenous communities and with uh, people in positions of power like uh, Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. So um, I feel like I'm finally, to a large extent, uh, fulfilling that charge that Granny B gave me, which was to assume a type of work that will have benefit for my own people. And then it's also a great honor to hopefully have some kind of positive impact for other uh, First Nations communities in the VCH region. So as we travel this canoe journey together, I am looking forward to getting to know each one of you that uh, are part of it. I've already been astounded by the team that Leslie has put together. It's, it's such a, a, a a uh, powerful team of people. Um, the energy that I uh, that I feel from every single one of them when I'm at the uh, Indigenous Health or Aboriginal Health offices is uh, second to none. 
And I'm really happy to be joining and looking forward to working together with DCH and uh, seeing the amazing places that we will end up together uh, over the next little while. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn and Leslie. Uh, I, I just think we're all inspired by your work, your leadership and your commitment to helping our organization on our shared journey. So thank you very much for sharing with us tonight. So now um, we're gonna to turn to open up our kitchen table discussions, which will happen in our virtual breakout rooms. The recording will be turned off, as I mentioned earlier. And we have tried to match our visitors up with uh, the themes that they wish to um, actually discuss. Uh, in some cases, we, we may have had to do a little bit of balancing, so you might only have got your second choice of theme. But essentially, um, we want this to be a safe and really informal, relaxed way for us to have a kitchen table discussion about very, very important issues. So I'm, I'm going to ask our, our colleagues at Nexus to take us to our breakout rooms. Um, each room will have an elder and uh, some VCH leaders working with you, recording in on notes um, what was the uh, input and the, and the nature of the discussion. So that can be shared by the elder as we come back to our circle at the end of the meeting. So thank you so much for our speakers of this part and um, we'll see you in the breakout rooms. Thank you so much. So um, I can say that, you know, we, we had a very interesting discussion and I think what we're, we're going to do is ask the elders to come back to us and just give us a little summary of the discussion and conversation sharing at the kitchen tables. So maybe what I'll do is I'm just going around my screen here and I think Elder Roberta, you come up, you're first on my screen. So can I ask you to, to share from your kitchen table? Oh, Sam, thanks so much, Penny. And I really want to hold my hands up in honor and thanks to our beautiful Deborah Baker for mm -hmm. facilitating our session so warmly and so respectfully and kindly. And, and like um, I shared with everyone around our kitchen table that it's always really, really lovely to listen to Patty and how she explains such complicated uh, things in health in such a personable way that really engages mm -hmm. you and makes you want to listen to what she has to say. So thank mm -hmm. you, uh, Patty, for um, giving a, a giving an overview of uh, you know of uh, COVID, children in schools, and what's been done around the data around the effectiveness of of COVID. Uh, thank you so very much, and then. Uh, thank you, Kim, for uh, sharing a little bit about when the question was asked about Indigenous people in, in urban areas. Thank you, Kim, for that response. And thanks to everybody around our kitchen table that uh, listened so respectfully and asked questions um, to Patty, which she answered everything. And um, uh, especially about... Uh, uh, the message at the very, very end uh, in closing was that Patty shared that there is great hope that that this is not going to go away, that mm -hmm. we will have great hope to continue to survive um, with uh, getting the vaccine. So I really hold my hands up in honor and thanks for for that strong message and also spoke around the booster shots and, and mm -hmm how the process of that, you know, they're doing it in the States, but it has to go through Health Canada. So thank you for explaining all of that, Patty. And uh, again, holding my hands up in honor and thanks uh, to both Deborah and Patty for uh, leading us and, and um, engaging us in such a warm and respectful way. Haichika, Haichika, Osiam, Osiam. Thank you so much. Pass it back to you, Penny. Thank you so much. Elder Roberta, always such a privilege to share any part of the day or night with you. Elder Doris Fox, you're next on, on my screen. Welcome and- I'm next up. <clears throat> you're next up, yeah. Oh, we had such an amazing, amazing table discussion with some really great questions that actually, um, 
I thought, how come the time went by like that? Uh, it's, it seemed like we were just getting into some really good questions. Mm -hmm. And we talked about um, the power that naming hospitals mm -hmm. uh, can affect the health of our, of our dear ones, of our family members, our community members. Um, like in Tlaaman, when the hospital is named after the Indian agent, it's hard enough to get our loved ones, our elders into hospitals because their thought is we don't want to go because that's where you go to die. Mm -hmm. And every grandparent, my mom and dad, all my elder aunties and uncles all fought tooth and nail to stay out of the hospital um, mm -hmm. because they said that's where you go to die. Mm -hmm. And when you have the name of the Indian agent Powell on the hospital, it makes it that much worse. So we talked about the importance of that and getting that kind of thing changed and how Vancouver Coastal Health and Aboriginal Health can stand beside them to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, for me, that was a hard one because so many of my elders wouldn't go to the hospital. And my mom, when she was dying of throat cancer, she said, I want to die in my own house, my own home, mm -hmm. in my own bed. And that was tough. And I, I understood though why she said that because so many of my family did go to hospital and die. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> um, we talked about the importance of having community uh, stand with us when we want to make those kinds of changes. Um, we were asked, how can we <clears throat> speed this up? Because <clears throat> there is a process. And I reminded everybody about COVID-19 and we shut the world down overnight, mm -hmm. literally overnight. No airplanes, no buses, no cars on the road, nobody traveling. That was it. So if we can do that, <clears throat> for COVID, we can do that for anything. Mm -hmm. And how important it is for all of us, all of us, I mean, Vancouver Coastal Health, Aboriginal Health, all the elders, all the community members to stand together to make these changes happen. Mm -hmm. Just as fast as we shut the world down, we can make these changes happen mm -hmm. quickly, quickly. So those were... Yeah, I. Sorry, I get a little excited. That was great. <laughs> <A little> excited. <laughs> it's like we just we didn't seem to have enough time to ask everything, mm -hmm. and you know this was a really good beginning and a really good start. Mm -hmm. So I raise my hands to everybody who mm -hmm. who asked questions, who sent in their questions, and you know it would be great if we could carry on the conversation at another time to mm -hmm. continue this. Um, these are great conversations, and as it was in my community, I'm sure in others, when the elders would gather, it was around the kitchen table mm -hmm. with yeah. food and snacks and tea, and mm -hmm. big decisions were made, and conflicts were resolved. All kinds of things happened around that kitchen table, mm -hmm. so this was a really fine example of our tradition, of our, mm -hmm. the way that we conducted business. So thanks everybody for that. that. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That, that was, I think we, you'll find a, a theme that we, we just got started and we mm -hmm. have, we have a lot more to talk about. So thank you, Elder Doris. That was this wonderful. This has been a great start though, really. It has been a great start. And I just wish somebody would have said to me, Elder Doris, you forgot to brush your hair when you left. <laughs> <laughs> I left home with a wet hair and it's all kinky and fuzzy and it's just, oh well. <laughs> we think you look beautiful, Elder Doris. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to ask Elder Glida, who is the next on my screen. Okay, Elder Glida, are you, do you have your microphone off? I, I can't hear you.
help is coming. All right. Okay. There good. she is. There she is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're so kind. Thank no, you. Um, no worries. No worries. Support. So um, we had a great round table and uh, I just uh, appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the round table um, kitchen table uh, and Marilyn Slut had uh, been the one to uh, facilitate and so I just want to appreciate that and um, our discussion was mental health and the opioid crisis and what a subject that is and uh, just talking about that and the, the virtual circle and, and what was shared. Uh, I love that uh, Mackenzie had uh, just done a big uh, workshop in her community, in her Squamish community, and she shared about that and um, how in the future they're going to be planning more. And I also appreciated the story that um, Margaret McGregor shared um, with a project what, uh, in Bella Bella about what makes our community healthy and land-based healing. And of course, say, in saying that, we want to bring back land-based, culturally, culturally appropriate services in, in our Vancouver Coastal Health area, especially with all of these issues with the opioid crisis and um, just talking about isolation uh, and how we haven't been able to connect and how um, issues arise from that and we need to have indigenous um, healers, ind indigenous support teams uh, in or psychiatrists and that sort of thing and just wanting to have a from from what i'm thinking is a safe supply for um the opioid crisis uh and harm reduction and working together and also focusing on the youth and uh it was said giving our youth uh, a purpose and having having them come together, giving them a voice. How can we get our youth to come together and, and to lift them up? And that was talked about a lot. And I think uh, lots of seeds were planted. And I do think uh, this is a good beginning towards getting our perspective together and how we are talking about rural settings and urban settings, I think that we can come together and find a way of making our community healthy again and uh, looking forward to um, working on more of uh, issues like this. And so I just raise my hands to all of you and uh, Kareen Andrews, um, Shannon, Mark, uh, just everyone that was here, uh, Dr. Ross Brown, uh, I just raise my hands to all of you and thank you for being around the kitchen table, OCM Emote Square again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder Glida. A very difficult theme, right, to, to talk about. Okay, so Elder Ruth. We shared our group together, so please, um, you're going to be the last but not least to report out on our, our kitchen table. Okay, I, we've still got you muted. Can you unmute yourself? No. Nope. There you go. Perfect. Yes, I would just like to tell you that I am I was very honored to be a part of this group. Thank you, Dr. Penny Ballum, for including me. 
and the participants were amazing, amazing people. Um, Dr. Brittany, she, uh, she opened the discussion with an overview of the report and how many people took part in the review and how it, uh, Janice Wardrop, she talked about Indigenous cultural safety and how important it is for people in the healthcare system to learn our ways of being. Uh, and she also talked about a pilot project on uh, mental health. Don Wilson stressed that we can never stop learning. And uh, it's about taking part in the Indigenous cultural safety training. It's a life, it's not just a workshop, it's a lifelong commitment. By doing this, all of us will do much better for our people. <clears throat> and the story about Joyce Eshikwan, Eshikwan, that was very touching. That was brought up as well about how she was treated and how we have to learn from that. This is our commitment. And then Dawn from Bella Bella stressed about learning about the place that you are in and the people that come from this place. Take time to listen. You always take time to listen. <clears throat> and Christopher said, all needs are not the same. So we have to adapt to the needs of our people. Inclusion of elders' teachings was important and uh, learn other ways of doing that was brought up. <clears throat> Integrate Indigenous health practices. Bring, bring your practices into the medical system as well. Our safety is very important. People should not be afraid of going into a hospital, into an emergency room, or a medical clinic. They should be made to feel that they are going to be taken care of. There's no judgment, no stigma. Doesn't matter what they did, what happened, how they got in there. You treat them with respect and kindness and care and love. And also brought up was the word connectedness. We all need to be connected. We all need to learn together. We all need to be with each other, learn other ways, but most importantly, be together as one as Doris said, we are one mind, one heart. And I feel that tonight we learn so much from the kitchen table. All we needed was apple pie and tea. Thank you, much love to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder Ruth. Thank you to all our elders and all those who helped um, lead, you know, the, the, our kitchen tables. Um, I think next time we will have to come with a pie. That will be part of the deal. I, I just, um, I want to ask Mer Chief Marilyn Slett, um, who, you know, I feel so privileged to have had the opportunity to get to know Marilyn and visit her and her community in Bella Bella on a couple of, you know, really incredible occasions, the opening of the big house and, and uh, a cleansing ceremony. But Marilyn, uh, it's just a really wonderful thing to have you working with us. So I, I just want to ask you, Deborah has had to leave, but maybe you could just say a few words at the close of our meeting. 
Definitely. Thank you, Penny. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of our board and, and to get to know all of our colleagues and do the work that we're doing. I also want to, um, you know, just really acknowledge uh, Dr. Don. Doc, that's what we call Don Wilson, Dr. Don in our community. Um, our community is so proud of the work that he, that he does, you know, outside of our community. And, you know, I, I just want to extend that um, to you, Don. And to share a little bit about, um, Margaret had shared a bit about a report that Pauline had worked on in, in uh, the late 80s and early 90s. And it speaks to what Don was talking about and it really translates to you know, how Indigenous people feel about um, our views on, on health. And this was uh, Pauline in 1994. The health sick view the strength of their community in a way which is similar to how they see being healthy. For example, people believe that the health sick culture and traditions are a source of strength for the community. Culture and traditions are also seen as important parts of health. Thus, there is a similarity here in how people view health and in the strengths of the community. You know, so, you know, the um, sharing that we did in, in the kitchen table is really valuable. And I, I know we call it an open forum, but it's really about, you know, making those connections, um, you know, across, you know, um, communities and, you know, through the different sectors that we work and, and help to, you know, share ideas and also share how we feel about contributions we can make, you know, to, to be healthy. And, you know, one of the things, you know, Don had shared, um, you know, his conversation with Granny Beatrice about, you know, going away to school and, and then his, you know, going into the medical practice. Uh, we had an elder, uh, Jim White. Uh, he was a former, uh, uh, he worked for the United Church and, and he had, you know, passed away a few years ago, former counselor. And people asked him, you know, quite a bit, why are you working for the United Church? How can you work there, you know, with everything that has happened, you know, in, in our communities? And this is long before, you know, a lot of the, the truth, you know, started coming out, you know, um, nationally, you know, but, you know, our communities knew the truth, right? So, and, and he said, and, and he shared it with us at the council table, as well, because he was a, an elected council member as well. And he said, you can't make change from the outside, right? You need to be working from within. And, you know, it really heartens to see, you know, Leslie introduce her team, you know, with everybody that's working, the, you know, Indigenous doctors and professionals that are working, because these are the things that are going to help, you know, our communities feel safe and access health. Because right now we have members that aren't, you know, because, you know, of how they feel, you know, within a system. So, you know, today was, I think, a really good day to, you know, talk about you know, what's important to us and, you know, begin planting those seeds. Thank you, uh, Penny. And it's a real, a real pleasure working with you as well. You know, Penny is, um, you know, really open and, you know, uh, really helps to facilitate, you know, really good discussions, you know, at our table uh, and really prompts, you know, difficult discussions. So thank you for that. Thanks, Marilyn. So um, our time is up. Uh, it's a little bit over, actually. And I, I just really want to thank our community members who have joined us tonight for our kitchen table conversations, chats, sharing, help to for us as an organization. I, I want to I want to thank our board for you know being here for your commitment and dedication to helping on us on our journey. And I, I want to thank all our all our colleagues from FNHA and other parts of our health sector and and uh, finally our our wonderful staff who have committed you know to this journey and really 
are dedicated to it and mean it and are, are, are endeavoring to learn every day. As, as was shared with us in our conversation, it's just the little things every day in, in every point of care that you don't have to do anything terribly dramatic. It's just having an open heart, making a connection, listening, taking the time to sit down and learn a name and hear a story. These are very simple things that cut across even the distinctions that we know are so important. But I just, I think we're all in this together. We're in one canoe, as Elder Doris told us. Um, we want to make it the biggest canoe in Canada. That's our, our goal for Vancouver Coastal. And, um, and when we're really together in that canoe and paddling, then we're going to we're going to do a bit of gunneling, which, you know, is where you stand up on the gunnels of your canoe and you bounce. And I think if we can all get in the canoe and then learn to gunnel together, we, we'll, we're, we're getting a lot closer there to where we need to be, Leslie. So, you know, a big thank you to everyone here and to our partners from Nexus who, you know, kept us uh, on the screen uh, and in the rooms and back out of the rooms. That was quite magical. I feel like I'm in one of those Star Wars movies. But we really appreciate your, your help and, and the very kind way you helped uh, all of us uh, older folks get our backgrounds up and unmute ourselves. So really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you to Vivian, our wonderful CEO, who helping to lead us and, and all of you. I hope you have a nice rest of the evening. And this is the beginning of many kitchen table conversations. And get your apple pie recipes out. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Aichika. Enjoy the first ever National Day of Reconciliation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Elder Doris. Okay, bye-bye. So Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Aichika, bye-bye. Wallace, guys. Yeah. Uh, good night. Bye-bye. OCM, OCM. Good to see everyone. Them Guanama. Oh, see, I'm It's just that the energy is so positive, it doesn't feel like leaving. <laughs> <laughs>